Yeah, so this is such an important topic today. So when you look at the causes of kidney disease, there's like 70 plus causes that at least I've researched and reviewed and studied on and so forth. But if you say, well, out of those 70 plus causes, what are like the top three? And I would say number one is diabetes. Number two is high blood pressure. Number three is obesity. And the reason diabetes matters so much in relation to kidneys is because it is the number one thing that causes our kidneys to fail. And it is also that thing that we can work on to control how our impact occurs on our sugars and onto our kidneys. So in other words, if you say, is this something that you can take action on right now to control what happens to your kidneys? Absolutely. But keep in mind that diabetes and kidney disease are absolutely guaranteed to be linked. And that's why having excellent control of your diabetes is absolutely critical. Yeah, so imagine your kidneys, they're like a barrier, right? So there's all these little nephrons in them, but imagine it like a barrier. And so what sugar does to this really tight barrier is the nature of sugar is, is it's toxic to the tubules and to the nephrons themselves. So as the sugar goes inside the kidneys, it actually damages that tight barrier and makes it leaky. So when that barrier becomes leaky, how do you manifest? You start to get very foamy or bubbly urine. And what that means is you're starting to spill what we call microalbumin, or if you look at all the different types of protein, we call it proteinuria, which means protein in the urine. And that's why all of this stuff matters so much is because once you break that barrier, you can't really go back and fix it. Well, we have strategies to try to take the pressure off the kidneys. But remember, your kidneys are so precious and you want to do everything to preserve that barrier and don't let that sugar destroy it. Yeah. So in terms of type 1 versus type 2. The big thing you want to know is type 1 is autoimmune. That's where your own immune system destroys your pancreas. You can't make insulin going on. So these folks actually need exogenous insulin, which means you have to inject yourself, you know, depending on the type of insulin with every meal. There's long-term, short-term insulin. Type 2, what's fascinating about type 2 is type 2 is insulin resistance, right? So what happens is, is you get all of this mechanism, which we're going to talk about in a second, where you have these cells that are no longer responsive. So we have medicines which make the pancreas work harder to produce more insulin, or we have medicine and or to make the cells become more sensitive to the insulin that's there. So you can sensitize or you can just produce more. The problem is, is it's like any worker. If you make a worker work overtime every single day, sooner or later, they're going to quit. And your pancreas can also quit if you keep trying to push it. So it's not uncommon for type 2 diabetics, especially poorly controlled type 2 diabetics, that they actually burn their pancreas out and they end up having or requiring insulin injection. So they're behaving eventually like type 1s. This is an excellent question. And what I would say is, is if you're somebody who's age 80 and over, as you know, the standard for what an A1C should be is, is much higher than somebody who's less than 80. That's not because we stop believing in the idea that you need tighter control. It's that when you're above the age of 80, the risk of becoming hypoglycemic or low sugars is high enough, and it can have devastating consequences that the most endocrine societies and other societies, they are a lot more liberal in terms of that going on. When it comes to kidney disease, what we know is, is that there are people who are pre-diabetic, who we do the kidney biopsies on, and we find out that it's full-blown diabetic nephropathy, which means that the diabetes has attacked the kidneys going on. And pre-diabetes means an A1C from 5.7 to 6.5, and diabetes being 6.5 and above. The take-home there is, is what we want to see is as much as you can to bring your A1C into the normal range. Now, that means that some people will be able to do it easier than others, but that's a goal to strive for. And even if you don't get there, in the back of your mind, realize that just because we give you an artificial target and say, if you're less than seven, it's good enough for government work. No knock on the government. But what I'm saying there is, is if that's okay at less than seven, still strive to make it better. Because what we know is that the microvascular complications of diabetes can take years. And once we have protein in the urine and kidney disease, most people, what they don't realize is it's not because their sugars are bad now. They may have been bad years ago. And even if you fix the sugars, me as a nephrologist, I'll still struggle to control the protein in the urine going on. So when it comes to sugar control, tighter is better without having 
hypoglycemic episodes. And just to add, you know, there's new ways to check your sugar so you don't have to keep pricking the fingers, especially people who are type 1s. There are all sorts of new devices out there. Some of them are still very expensive, but I tell you, in the next couple of years, you're going to see the cost of them come down and you're going to see them become more and more affordable. Yeah, so, so you know, when we go back to sort of the nutrition history, and we talk about, you know, when people were coming out and talking about things like following a low-fat diet and what the reasoning behind that was. There's been so much debate about whether a low-fat diet actually worked or not. And um, a lot of people think that low-fat diets really never worked. The truth behind that statement on low-fat diets was that when people went on low-fat diets, they actually didn't cut their fat. They actually ate more refined sugars, more protein, more animal products, more oils, more everything. So even though as a percentage, we saw a little bit decline in low-fat, overall in increase. Now, what's that got to do with diabetes? So it turns out that as the fat enters your cells, just like as the fat goes inside your liver, you get fatty liver, you get all these inflammation and inflammatory processes going on. You get scarring going on. And of course, you get insulin resistance. So the one-two hit is the first hit is you fill your cells up with fat. And so then when the insulin tries to act on them to go ahead and dispose of the sugar that's floating around in your blood, it doesn't work. This is the same thing when we talk about, you know, what do you want the sugar to do? You want the muscles to take up the sugar and use it. What you don't want is to have the liver and all of the stubborn belly fat that's there and the visceral fat that's around those organs that's the worst type of fat to take up all that sugar and store it. You know, fat is an active hormone-based organ. And so what we're finding out more and more about the fat that we store is it releases so much inflammatory markers. So with diabetes, what ends up happening is, is as people eat these really processed foods and high fat foods, we're not talking about healthier PUFAs or MUFAs, which is polys or monounsaturated fatty acids. We're talking about really refined stuff. You're really fried French fries that are rich in saturated fat because that's what makes them taste good right? A lot of people, they go for the taste because fat actually tastes good. But the problem is, is even though you think it tastes good, you're doing yourself so much harm. And if you switch over to fruits, fruits taste great and they're going to make you live longer. So at the end of the day, the bottom line with diabetes is, is it creates insulin resistance by getting all this fat. Then you throw all this sugar in there and the sugar has nowhere to go. So it starts to damage your eyes, your brain, your heart, your kidneys, your lungs, you name an organ, and it's being damaged by all the sugar floating around. And that's the one-two punch that we talk about when it comes to diabetes. And, you know, what, what's another point that you raised was what about people who are focusing on a plant-based diet? You know, the, the difficulty that we're facing now is there's two types of plant-based diets, right? It used to be that when we talked about a plant-based diet, we meant a whole foods plant-based diet. Now, there's a highly processed plant-based diet. And so a lot of people who say, you know, I'm a vegan, that's great. But you also want to focus on the quality of food. And so you're focusing on minimally processed as much as you can whole food plant-based diet. And that's what's going to help you. So that's the diet that's naturally low in fat. But the other version, which is the unhealthy, highly processed plant-based diet that we're starting to see in the form of lots of very convenient packaged products. So I'm a bariatrician and one of the concerns that I have is I'm starting to see patients who are following plant-based diets and they're gaining weight. And when you ask them what they're eating, it's so shocking because it's so bad for their overall health. But in their mind, they think that they're actually trying to do some good. 